Gardens. Welcome everybody to City Forum for 2017. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our inaugural 2017 speaker, um, Andrew Dobbs, who is the program director for the, say it correctly, Texas Campaign for the Environment. Uh, and uh, has spent, I guess, the last six years in that position. Um, uh, five in this position, the six with the group. Five, yeah. five, five, six. Uh, he's, got, he's actually a, uh, attended UT and uh, does work in environmental journalism in addition to all his work in terms of advocacy on environmental issues and solid waste. And so today's talk is focused in on um, making connections to the city of Boston's zero waste compost and climate change community organizing. And uh, how that kind of led to a multi million dollar endeavor. Yeah. So, with that, I'm, I'm pleased to turn it over and uh, join me in welcoming you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you so much for having me. I'm, uh, like I said, I'm Andrew Dobbs. I'm the program director and legislative director with Texas Campaign for the Environment. Um, for those who don't know, and there's a few people that work for us, so they can tell you all about it too um, in the audience. Uh, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan citizens group. We're statewide. Um, we have offices here and in Dallas and Houston, and over 40,000 members across the state. Um, we have Canvas, and uh, we, we our, our big thing in the way that a lot of people know us is that we have a door-to-door -door Canvas uh, that reaches out to folks, generates our membership, raises our money, and, and gets contact with decision makers. And we have Canvas in every single legislative district in Texas, all 150 House districts, all 31 state Senate districts, and I think we're the only group that can say that. Um, uh, I wanted to. I was invited to talk today about composting, and I, and I and I thought about what I wanted to talk about with it, and uh, I came up with the point to talk about compost climate and community organizing. I think I've, I've it, it might shift a little bit from what I wrote in the initial description, what I'm doing now, um, and what I've thought about as I've been thinking about this, because I, I, when I saw about the city forum, I wanted to talk about cities um, and how cities uh, impact this, um, and how what what the role of the city is in creating these problems and how those of us who are interested in uh, working for cities and working with cities and, and impacting urban policy can make a huge difference and leverage those positions in order to make some big changes in the world for the better. Um, I'm speaking for TC, I'm also kind of, a lot of these ideas are things that are my personal ways of conceptualizing these things and, able, and my own personal ideas about how the work works, right? So the outcomes are owned by TCE, and if anything it seems screwy or off the wall or whatever, just blame me and not them, okay? Um, so I wanted to talk about that. So let's start out by talking a little bit about waste here. Um, because, and about the cities, um, because for the vast majority of human history, probably about 95% of human history, there was no such thing as a city. And for in the last in 10,000 years when we've been doing this city thing, uh, up until the last, uh, for 99% of that, uh, the vast majority of humans didn't live in the cities at all, right? In the last 100 years or so, we've shifted to where most people don't live in cities to where most people do. And this is something that y'all are probably all intimately aware of, and this is probably 101, but it's stuff that I think about and that I've been thinking about with this too. And obviously, waste, and, and waste is a product of cities, um, city, the, the, or at least of the same forces that created cities. Right, um, and when, so I think it's important to start out by thinking about like what are the forces at play here, and what is a city, and how does it do this? Right, um, you know, cities are the product of surplus value. Right, um, without surplus value, you can't have a city, um, and once you have cities, you necessitate surplus value, and so it creates a system of production that that continues to generate that. Right, it's a big point of uh, controversy uh, among anthropologists and historians right now about which. Which is came first, right? The 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 sudden, the, you know, the stationary settlements that could then that then necessitated a surplus production in order to in order to sustain them, or did we start creating this surplus and then have cities as a result, right? Um, you know, it doesn't really matter. The point is, is that at some point we went from pretty much everybody was generating their own food, just like an, like very similar to animals in the wild, right? You're going out there and you're hunting and gathering every day, or you know you might have small scale accumulation of some sort, to where we had a situation where at least some people were were doing most accumulation, and these other people over here are doing the consumption. And at that point, you have a breakdown in the normal metabolism of resources through the human community, right? But prior to that, you know, there was no such thing as waste, just like there's no waste in nature, right? Uh, the definition of waste is a, is a material that has negative value, 
right? Meaning that you have to pay somebody else to take it away from you. You don't see birds having to like convince, you know, some other animal or like, or create some kind of exchange with other animals to take their droppings, right? It's just not the way it works because there's other organisms that need that for their food. And those organisms then become food for something else. And, it, and it's, a, it's a circular cyclical model, right? But at the point when you have one group of people that's doing the production over here, right? And another group of people that are doing the consumption over here. And, there's a, and they're different people in different spaces, right? Then you have that disconnect. And you can have, and once that disconnect happens, waste becomes possible and, in fact, potentially inevitable, right? Because now you have these materials over here that can't get back to where they can be food, and so you have to do something with them. They have to be removed, right? City, this happened in cities, okay? Now, cities ended up developing some some mechanisms for dealing with this, right? Because obviously, if they hadn't, they just wouldn't exist anymore, right? They would have they would have died out. The main mechanisms that they used were first just kind of dumping it in nearby waterways and letting that go because that's what we've always done, right? And at, at the scale that we've lived before, that it's not a matter where where do the fish put their waste, right? It's in the waterways, right? And all the other animals put it there too. At the small scale, it doesn't matter that much, but when you concentrate those populations and you start doing that, that started having negative impacts. Same thing. The other thing that we would do is we would actually bring some of the we would bring some limited agricultural production into the cities themselves, namely uh, pigs, right? And that's what cities for a long time did with their with their discards, right? When you discards the 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 composition of waste for the longest time was a lot of ash and a lot of food waste. The ash you could just kind of bury the, or, or dump into the waterways or other places. The food waste you could just feed to the pigs, right? And then you slaughter the pigs, and now, you got, and, and now you've got a little bit of agriculture to supplement whatever's coming in from outside the city, right? This, is the, this was the way, the way that things were. But then you have the Industrial Revolution, right? That same system of production that necessitated the cities in the first place ends up ramping up in a big way, in part because, and we can get into a lot of the details here and the history that caused that, but basically you have a circumstance where the, the, the kind of advent of colonialism brings a lot of resources, not just from outside the city, but from outside the entire national circumstance, right? And ends up creating new opportunities for living off of surplus. And so you have these, so you have cities grow. Then it makes the, the economic circumstances make it such that industrial production becomes necessary. That brings in more and more and more people so that cities swell. And very quickly, the waste production overpowers those mechanisms that were used for taking care of the waste. Now, when you just dumped it into the rivers or whatever, now that gets overwhelmed and those rivers actually become poisonous. The pigs can't eat it all, and so the streets start to pile up with garbage, with filth. People start to die. Cholera, yellow fever, typhoid, it becomes a serious problem, epidemic in these places. They say that in the, in the, late, 19, in the late 18th century, you could smell New York City six miles away. Um, travelers would know six miles away that they were getting close to New York City because they could smell it, right? It was filthy, and it created problems. In 1881, the city of New York created its first sanitation program. It was one of the first in the, in the world. The sign on that says, you live in the greatest city in the world. Let's make it, uh, let's make it the, the cleanest and healthy, Okay. And that was, and this was a huge innovation. At first, the department was like subject to like terrible corruption. They didn't do anything. They were just, it was just a slush fund for corrupt politicians. But then a Civil War general named George Waring comes in and, and fixes the agency and makes it, you know, this great thing. So, so much so that in 1903, they had a citywide ticker tape parade through the streets of New York to celebrate the sanitation workers. And this changes the nature of cities in a pretty dramatic way, right? Um, this changes cities into, uh, this makes it possible so that cities can be a lot healthier to live in. But it has a couple of other impacts. It has a couple of other uh, unintended consequences that are really important for the work that I do and that TCE does. The first is that it disconnects. Now it, now it creates a subsidy for waste to producers, right? Because the government was the ones that, the governments were the ones that stepped in and says municipal governments, city governments were the ones that stepped in and said we're going to solve this problem. Now producers don't ever have to think about the end of life of their products because they know that somebody else is going to take care of it, right? That's that that ends up creating a lot of problems over time. To where now, like you know, that's why it's cheaper for them to make. You know, the, you know, you see the oranges. Have, has anybody seen this this meme online where there was an a peeled orange in a plastic container? And it's like, gosh, if only they had had a, a, a wrapping around this orange to protect it from the elements. 
And it's like, they literally, like, it was, I think it was at a Whole Foods. They peeled the, somebody, like, peeled this orange and then put it in plastic and sold it. That's because the, whoever did that never has to think about the plastic. It, you know, it never has to think about the plastic because somebody else is taking care of it. The other issue here is that it, uh, it, it, it got rid of the pigs, right? And so, like, it actually, like, kind of completed the process of, of separating the urban environment from agriculture entirely so that now all of their food products, all of their ma basic resources must be imported from outside of the city, right? Um, and completed that process. And that there's that alienation, that disconnect between the resource base and the, and, and the urban population. As most people live in cities, that means that now most of us are completely divorced from our resource base. And so we don't have any concept of what is actually sustainable or not. And there's another factor that goes into this that's related to that, which is that any material system like this that's gonna, that's gonna be, that's gonna survive has to have an ideology that comes up that both assimilates it into people's lives and that justifies its existence and that enables it to reproduce itself, right? And with waste, we have the, the ideological kind of, the core of the ideology of waste was this concept of away, right? Where does the trash go? It goes away. Where does the sewage go? It goes away. Hey, make sure you throw that away when you're done with it, right? Well, where is away? The point is, is that it taught us not to think about it anymore. And whereas before it was very obvious where our waste was going, and it was very obvious that this was a problem for people, now it's been a, we've been able to divorce this from our mindset entirely. So where is away? Well, it's important to remember that this ideology was like was, was coming up in a context of much larger ideological systems, right? Uh, and that influenced it. And so away means colonized communities. It means communities of color. It means poor people. It means it means uh, poor nations on the other side of the world. It means it means people. It means the people that we the people that are disposable is where our disposable goods go, right? Um, and that creates a series. And so that's how cities and our waste policies have been at the core of the injustice, the battles against uh, for justice that we've been fighting for many, many years. Um, these pictures are actually like really interesting uh, like depictions of that. The one up in the top left there um, is actually, does anybody know where that is? Does anybody recognize that right offhand? That's the city of Houston, actually, in the 1970s. The Whispering Pines landfill was a landfill that was actually sited, like most landfills, in, in uh, a middle-class black neighborhood. And this picture is actually from the personal collection of uh, Professor Robert Bullard, who teaches at Texas Southern University, widely known as the father of environmental justice. Um, he was a part of this of this activist fight against this facility, and his pioneering research showed that waste facilities in Texas and Houston were not only cited were not cited in poor communities. Income did not determine where they were located. They were predominantly located in middle class black communities, and race was the deciding factor in their citing. And in fact, it appears that they were used by policymakers as a tool of breaking the power of middle-class black communities, okay? That's where away is, okay? When you threw things away in the 1970s in Houston, you were throwing them on middle-class black communities in order to break their political power. Now, Robert Bullard like, doesn't necessarily, he uses the term the father of environmental justice for, you know, to sell some books and whatnot because his books are awesome and he should, but he, he will push back on that. And he'll say the real first environmental justice struggle that we found was actually the one down here on the bottom left. Does anybody know where that is? That is the city of Memphis in 1968, the sanitation workers' strike. And the most notable thing about this about this was that um, this that Martin Luther King intervened in that and was was assassinated during that during that campaign. Um, and, and it was uh, local police and, and state forces were actually involved in his assassination in order to stop him from helping striking sanitation workers from securing better benefits, because that's how this intersects also. Right, our waste culture actually also perpetuates a culture of poverty and uh, among among the people that work in these conditions too, right? And then up here on the top right, that's in India, where uh, a lo where an NGO there has worked with communities to help them develop composting systems, and in order to bring traditional agricultural systems back into urban Indian environments, in order to empower women and to and to and to deal with food security. So that's kind of another way. So the point is, is that if you are interested in cities, this is, this is a huge opportunity because so many different problems that we care about, whether it's injustice, whether it's food, whether it's water, whether it's climate, whether it's any of these things, all intersect at this point. And the cities have been given all the power to do something, given all the power to deal with this, right? Or predominantly given that power.
state and federal regulations as well, but cities have a, a tremendous opportunity. And so for groups like ours that want to have a world w without pollution, that want a more democratic and just society for everybody, this is a place for us to intervene. This is a place where we can make a difference, okay? And our community organizing can have an impact there. Um, this is, so that's, that's, this is, this is what we have to keep in mind. Now, um, it's also important to keep in mind that there are obstacles to city policymakers doing some of this sometimes, right? Especially on the climate front. Let me talk about that real quick. Let's talk about climate here because it's in the title and I'm supposed to talk about it. And I've been talking for 15 minutes and haven't yet. Um, is that, you know, obviously there's the immediate impact of waste, right? Especially organic waste, the stuff that we're composting, right? That goes in the landfills, it breaks down, it produces methane gas. Methane is a very powerful climate gas, um, as everybody, as most people in here probably know. Um, if you can get organics out of the landfills, you can prevent that methane from being produced, and we can we can reduce our impact on the climate, um, especially as we now have a situation where the federal government will not help us on climate change, where the federal government will actively harm our climate and our environment. We now have an opportunity, uh, and, and, and that's that's been the state, case in our state forever. Um, in fact, in, to a certain extent, where it's everybody else in the country is now getting a taste of what it's been like in Texas. It's funny whenever people are like, but that cabinet official doesn't even believe in this. I'm like, yeah, that's how it works. Welcome to Texas-style governance. Yeah, that's, that's how we do it. You should hear about the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. It's not for environmental quality. It's on environmental quality. Um, you know, and... But here in the city, we can actually do something about that, right? It's a place where we can say, hey, you know what? There's, this is not enough in all of this, in everything we're talking about. It's not sufficient, but it is necessary, right? This is not going to solve the problem entirely, but when the problem is solved, all of these things will be done. And since we can't do all this other stuff, there's a lot of doers in this room. There's people that want to, like, do something, right? Let's. These are the places where we can start and we can work on this and solve these things and build movements and build change so that when we have the power to be able to do these other things, this stuff will have been taken care of already, right? We won't have to worry about this because we can work on the next big things. Does that make sense to everybody? The thing is, is that, you know, policymaking can be can be challenging. And sometimes with the climate stuff, there, there, the other impact on the climate here that I didn't get to has to do with the life cycle issues here, right? Um, the more that things are having, the more that we're having to extract resources from the ground and process raw materials into intermediate materials and manufacture new goods and bring those things to market, the more that we're having to create to grow our food, God knows where, thousands of miles away, and ship it across, those supply chains create uh, create a climate crisis, right? They are that's where the that's where these these uh, greenhouse gases are coming from. And in fact, you know, the way that greenhouse gases are normally broken down on the big pie charts that you see is they look at where's the tailpipe, right? Like what tailpipe put this stuff into the atmosphere, right? Was it a car? Was it a factory? Was it and was that you know what what was it, right? And so if you look at that, waste is always this like tiny little like two percent sliver there, right? And so you hear me talking about all this, and you're like, this is probably why nobody's here. You know, <laughs> it's smaller than normal. They're like, well, it's just the 2% sliver, right? No, it's not. Because if you actually say, okay, well, why are all those tailpipes putting out things, right? What connects all of them? Why did they fire up that power plant that day? What was in that truck that was going down the freeway? If you look at it as systems, the provision of goods and services the stuff, you know, the, the stuff, the moving of stuff from one place to the other and the consumption and disposal of all that stuff is 40, is more than 40% of our, of our climate impact. So this is a place, if you can impact that system, then you can have a, a pretty big impact on climate change. And cities have a big impact on that system. So that's what we're talking about here. Now, the point I'm making at the bottom here is that um, not all policymakers will see it that way, and not all city employees will see it that way. There is a strong tendency, and you may be getting this in some of your classes or not, I hope not, to think about that pipe, that, that tailpipe model, right? And there's an even stronger tendency to think about just the tailpipes that are in our city limits, right? This is something that happened when we were doing the net zero climate goal a few years ago um, here in Austin. I was a part of that process. And we, I kept trying to tell them, like, don't just calculate what, what's coming. Don't just calculate the methane coming out of the landfills in town. Calculate how much our recycling and our composting and our zero waste programs are reducing climate gases overall. This, are, this is our real impact. They wouldn't listen to me because they were interested in the tailpipes, right? It's a good program. It's a great policy. We're using it to get this stuff done. But the point is, is that as 
future or current policymakers for urban policy, take that bigger vision, right? And give yourself that opportunity to have a bigger impact, right? And use that to engage your policymakers and to engage civil society wherever you're working in such a way that they can actually they can actually see the impact and be motivated to do the really hard work that's involved here. Does that make sense? So that's kind of the big picture here in terms of, of, of how waste impacts climate and environmental justice. If we don't solve, like, solve, getting composting and recycling and everything else in the city of Austin will not solve the problem by itself. But when we solve the problem, Austin will have solved all of those things. So let's go ahead and do it right now. Um, so the big concept, the big kind of animating concept behind all of this, um, behind people that do this kind of work, is the idea of zero waste. And if you'll notice, this is a great uh, graphic over here on, on the top left from an awesome group out of Colorado called EcoCycle. Um, that's a non-profit. You see nodding heads. I don't know if you're from Boulder or something. Know those folks. But they're a great group that do, um, that, that have done this stuff. And if you're, if you're going into a city government after you're leaving this and, and working in, after you graduate, um, they have a great guide on how to get any community to zero waste in 10 years. And it's just a very step-by-step -step explicit plan that's laid out there. Austin's decided to do it more complicated. That's the way the policy goes sometimes in the city of Austin. Um, and the, we started before that came out. Out, but definitely check that out. But this is showing that like that linear economy is exactly what I was uh, up top is exactly what I was describing earlier, right? That we have these people over here producing, we ship it into the cities, we consume, and now we're left with this stuff that we have to find a way to get rid of, right? That is that is the unsustainable model that we have. Underneath is the circular model, which is exactly what I was also describing as that's the way that nature works. And what zero waste policy is all about is about intervening to reintroduce natural natural systems and natural models into the urban system, the urbanized civilization that we live in today, right? To bring that back and to recognize that the challenges that we're facing are caused by our abandonment of those things. So let's reintroduce those at kind of a higher level at an, in a new way. Right. And so that's that's what that indicates right there is, is that you can see that. Um, and so that's that's what we're doing here is trying to bring Austin to zero waste. You can see on the right here, this is actually just from uh, uh, commercial sources, from privately hauled sources. But this includes multifamily. So it's most of the people in Austin. This is the breakdown. That green section is compostable. Um, but actually, there's a there's actually a big chunk of the blue section there that's actually probably better composted than recycled because the way the city did their breakdown is they put all paper into recycling. But actually, if you know anything about how the paper comes out of the recycling, a lot of it is 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 soaked and and, and messy and whatnot. So probably about half the paper could come in here, and paper is the biggest chunk of of that. So you could probably take another you know, 10% or so and add it to the green. And so now you're talking about half the things that you're throwing away. Just about half of the things that are going into our trash are compostable. If we have a system for compost, then we can take away half of our trash. And, if, and, when we, and, and then, not only that, but where are we putting that? We're putting it into compost, which means great, better soil. The economics of it don't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to ship dirt across the country. Right, or to bring dirt from somewhere else. Dirt is consumed locally, okay? Compost is consumed locally, and so it creates new opportunities and it shifts the economics of soil itself. And so it creates the opportunity for us to bring agriculture back into the cities. Right. Remember, we said that that was a huge that was a huge problem here was that we had finally completed this process of a complete alienation of the city and of the urban environment from its agricultural base. Right. As we're seeing right now, as I'm sure a lot of y'all are studying, if you're here, you're into I think a lot of folks are probably into this. We're bringing agriculture back into the city. You ha like we all know the city is mostly it has a lot of impermeable cover has a lot of and our, our processes have destroyed a lot of the soil there the land is expensive we need it to be as productive as possible for this to make sense compost is in is indispensable to that and the more compost you can have the better things are going to work out that picture at the bottom there's anybody heard of urban roots local nonprofit yes yeah, see some nodding heads and raised hands that's awesome they're a great local nonprofit that connects at-risk youth with urban agriculture to produce food that they can then sell uh, so that we have better, healthier, locally produced food that also has a climate impact because we're not shipping things from across the country, right? So zero waste has this huge climate impact, and compost is absolutely indispensable to that. Um, you have to have it, and that's why we wanted it here in the city. And we know that, you know, like, we, we, we the, the, the numbers are very clear. You know, whenever we're going door-to-door -door on this, people are like, Michael, did you go door-to-door -door on this? Okay, so did you did, did you go door-to-door -door on this? 
Okay, so we a couple of folks have canvassed here for us. Um, with this with this campaign, one of the frequent things was, "Why well, are you compost in my backyard?" Thing is, only about nine, like only about five to ten percent of people ever compost in their backyards. And if you actually really push these people and you say, "Well, what about that? The end result? Like, what is your product like?" The number of that ten percent that are act, that five to ten percent that are actually creating like usable, like vi viable compost in the end is is smaller still, right? A lot of people, uh, it's a challenging process and that stuff will sometimes end up in the landfill anyways. Point is that we had to find a solution for that 90 to 95%. And just like you used to back in the day, if you're if you're a recycler, you had to collect, and it's actually this way in a lot of communities to, to this day, you had to collect it up and take it to a drop-off center. And so you have the five or 10% of, of, you know, of hippies and whatnot that would take their stuff to the drop-off center. Now, like, like, but then we took it to the curbside and we got up to like, you know, 60, 70, 80% of the population doing it. That's the same. We want the same impact for, for curbside composting. So that's why we made this policy a priority. Um, let me go to the next slide here. So how do we do that? Because here's the thing. That is a, that it's expensive, right, to do this. Um, you know, you're talking about like the inputs that you need or the, the, the things that you need to make it happen are, it's just like, this is the way it is with any of these things. It's pretty obvious, but it's good to like kind of to list them out so that you can conceptualize it is you need a way to pick it. You need a way to pick it up and somebody to pick it up. You got to get it somewhere to be processed. Then you got to have that. And then you got to have a way to get it marketed, right? Um, and, and, and sold, right? Same thing with, with, with recycling, right? If you're ever working to get a recycling system set up somewhere, you can do it in a lot of different ways and you can go from, you know, we have a guy with a, with a flatbed truck who's going to take it to this place and we're going to have people who are doing community service hand sort and then we're going to, we're going to just, you know, call up and we're going to work the phone books to find markets. You know, that, that's one way to do it in a smaller place. Obviously there's more sophisticated ways for bigger places. So with this, if you look at all of that, right? If you do all that math, it comes out to about $20 million a year. Okay, that's not cheap. That's an expensive program for a city like this. And, you know, it's also coming up in the context of the 10-1 City Council, which was seriously focused, as they should be, on affordability um, and had more fiscal kind of conservatism than we had seen in a city council in a long time. So, you know, we knew these things, but I think that we had kind of uh, neglected to give them the, the, the significance that they deserve. So that, you know, we, we'd been working on this forever. Um, in fact, and this is an important point that I'm going to step, well, let me talk about this for a second. Um, we had gotten the zero waste pol the zero waste master plan in place. That's what's on the bottom left there, the cover of that. And that's a crucial step in this process because all of this is only possible because of the organizing that we did years before when we got that passed. And all, and that was only, that was, that was only possible because of organizing we did years before to get the right policymakers in place. To, 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 to make those decisions. And that was only possible because of organizing we did years before to organize landfill neighbors to fight the expansion of landfills in Northeast Austin. One of those, you know, low income, predominantly communities of color that was being, that was, that had been designated as our away around here, right? Um, we organized those folks and, and, and that was only possible because we had built the organization that we're in before. So the work that you're doing is always building up for something else, right? But we get those landfill neighbors organized. We then, you know, shift the policy context and start and, and take the concept of away away from our policymakers, right? So that now they see this as something that is right here in our town. We make them interested in zero waste so that they appoint the right people and hire the right people um, to to uh, to make these policies. Then we're able to get this policy in place, and that forms a backstop. If you're going to be involved in urban policy, it's not a bad idea to start with a context like that with those kind of backstop policies, whether it's your, your zero waste plan, your climate justice plan, your equity or affordability plan. You know, sometimes these things are just created in order to like, like to placate certain constituencies and then they sit on the shelf and nobody ever does anything with them. You know, that's an, the, the context that allows that to happen is when you don't have sustained organizing and sustained activism that makes them continue thinking about that, right? That can happen in a lot of places, and that does happen in a lot of places. That's kind of what's happened. That's what Dallas tried to do with theirs. Unfortunately for them, we have an office in Dallas, and we continue cracking the whip to make sure that they're moving forward on it. With this, we, uh, you know, we had that policy in place, and so we we're like, oh, well, you know, composting's in there. Everybody on the council said they like the plan, you know, and they support it, so we're going to get this. And then I'm in a committee hearing, and 
Somebody suggests from the dais that we should make it just a voluntary program. And if people want to do it, want the service, they can have it, and they can pay a subscription fee. And then, you know, and if they don't, they don't have to. Thing is, is that this is one of those ideas that's been, that every time somebody proposes a policy like this in a place, that gets proposed too. And about half the time, the city decides to try that. And every single time that they try it, it fails, right? Because the system isn't sustainable. Because pricing is based on participation. And if you have any kind of shock that causes a drop off in participation, now you got to raise the prices on everybody else. Well, we all took Economics 101. It means there's a certain number of people that are going to drop off the program because of that price increase, right? So what do you have to do to respond to that? Raise the price, drop off, raise the price. It's death spiral, right? The thing falls apart. Um, and you never get the participation that you think you're going to get. So I knew this. Um, and a lot of people sh and, and city and department staff should have known this, but department staff, instead of saying, well, that's a dumb idea, everybody that tries it, it you know, it screws them up and there's no, and it doesn't work, right? Rather than saying that, I said, well, that's an interesting idea. We'll consider that. Problem, right? I'm sitting there watching our work fall apart in front of me. And that's when we swung into action, right? Um, and we set a strat, we, we, we set a strategy and we decided to get this done. Um, the, the kind of keys to this strategy. Um, the first was that we knew that this was going to be a budget question and we focused on the budget process. Um, does anybody know who the guy on the top left is there in the white shirt? Anybody? If I had a Jolly Rancher, I'd throw it at you if you knew it. Um, it's, uh, Ed Van Enu. Uh, Ed Van Enu, he's the, uh, the budget director for the city of Austin, right? Really nice guy. Like, when the budget process is happening, he knows everything that's in the budget, right? He's, he, he kind of shepherds that through the process, and he liked our thing. Um, so I just kind of put him there to give him a shout-out and, to, and, to, and to, uh, to talk about the budget process here. Um, here's the thing about the city budget. The city budget is passed in September, okay? And they have all the hearings for it in, like, August, right? And so this August, maybe July, if, if the, you're going to have some groups – Say, oh my God, the budget is going to be passed. We need to get our thing in the budget. Let's go and work on the budget. And they're going to start in July and August and September. And they're not going to get anything done because that's not when the budget process starts. And by the time you've gotten there, it is way down the tracks. Whatever city you're going to be working in, get to know that budget process. Every city is different. And the more you can know the details of it and the ins and outs of it, the more proactive and strategic you can be about intervening in that process to get what you want, right? So what we did is we saw that the very first presentation of the budget on the budget was going to be in, I believe, April, right? And what we did is we is for months before that, we gener we used our door-to-door -door canvas. That's our, one of our canvassers up there, uh, Katie Rowe. doesn't work for us anymore, but worked for us for years and years um, uh, up there. Uh, we sent our canvassers out and generated letters. We generated phone calls. Um, and then we have a pretty big database of uh, about 10, 15,000 Austin residents that we can use to send out email petitions that then email council members, right? So we started, and we weren't, we didn't do it, help, you know, helter skelter. We, we picked the spots, the, the, the districts that we needed to impact. We picked the, the members that we needed to work on. We picked the, the strategic points where it was going to be the most effective, right? And the things that we needed them to say. Um, and one of the other things that we did is we knew the first one was coming in April, but we knew that there was going to be kind of a, a, another big kickoff date um, in May. That our kind of the first thing that really would ever talk about composting was going to be in May. So what we did is we spent months with our canvassers at the door taking photographs of people, um, holding signs saying where they wrote with markers like a laminate sheet why they wanted composting in Austin, curbside composting. And we took those pictures. Um, we also went to Earth Day Austin. This is why I remembered it was in May. Because we went to Earth Day Austin. We set up at Earth Day Austin. And we had people that were coming up to us. We said, hey, we're taking pictures of folks. Um, you know, like Make a sign and take a picture. You live in the city of Austin. And we ended up making this banner down here. That's over 400 Austin residents holding signs why they why they support curbside composting, right? Um, and to be honest, that, that poster cost us very little to make um, because, and, and this is like, because I, I want to kind of shout out to grassroots activism here. What that is, is those, it's, it's vinyl banners. They're actually old Steve Adler for mayor vinyl signs that have been on his office. I called his staffer who had worked for the campaign and he just had them and gave them to me for free. Um, we taped them back to back so that you wouldn't see the Adler for mayor thing. Um, and then we just printed those off on our color printer in the office. Um, so we probably, probably the biggest expense ended up being, besides labor, 
um, ended up being the, the toner. Um, and then we just taped them down. Um, and it actually looks really cool. We still have it, and it's wrapped up. That's 20 feet long, right, to create that kind of visual direct action impact at that point. Um, we, uh, before that, like I said, we had targeted certain members so that, and what we did, and we got real creative with that, right? Um, we did things like, um, with, uh, representative, uh, our council member Sabino Pio Renteria, if you live on East Riverside, um, he's your guy or, or parts of, large parts of East Austin, so up the 7th street, he's your member. Um, uh, Pio was at first bucking us real bad on the cost thing. Okay. So we went to his district over and over and over again and got calls at the door. I sent out like people like our campuses being like, hey, so you're into this? Like, yeah, absolutely, cool. Here's my cell phone. We're calling the city councilman's office right now. Will you say something like this to him? So we flooded his inbox. Then we went and we sent him a bunch of emails. He got like a couple. He got like a thousand or so, um, like emails in rapid succession. Then I, I went and looked at his public sp supporter sheet, the people that had endorsed him, and there were a bunch of my friends that were involved in composting and, and environmental stuff. And I called each one of them up and I said, "Hey, will you call up Pio? Do you happen to have his cell phone number? Give him a shout and tell him that you want him to support composting." We did other things too. He basically, I got a call. Can you please come to city hall right now? And I got there, and he's like, I'm with you on composting 100%. You know, it's okay. And then later on in the process, when we were ha we had a press conference right before this picture down here was taken, um, and he was like, I can't be there, but will you please read a quote for me at the press conference to let everybody know that I support composting? You can tell me anything else I can do. So that kind of, it worked, right? And as we're going through a time right now where, you know, policymakers, where policymaking is going to get really terrible, you know, finding those strategic people to focus on and doing that sort of thing really does have a difference. Um, we also worked on staff, right? Um, the letters we usually wrote were always to just, uh, were always to like council members and elected officials. With this one, we, re we wrote thousands, hundreds of letters, probably a, a thousand or more, to the city manager. And if you look in this picture down here with the banner, uh, that's me on the end wearing this same jacket and jeans and shoes, I think. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, I have more, I promise. Um, and then right next to me is is uh, the former city manager, city manager at the time, Mark Ott of uh, the city of Austin. That's one of those points of knowing where the decisions are really made, right? Because policy is made by council and staff and acts policy, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that staff will always find ways of not doing the things that they don't want to do. Right, um, and if they don't want to do it, they're going to start tell, saying things like, "Well, you know, it's not our place to tell you what you can do or not, but it's going to cost a uh, hundred million dollars, um, and we'll definitely have to uh, we'll definitely have to tear down a bunch of schools to make that happen, or whatever. You know, like we're definitely going to have to, yeah, like pave over, uh, you know, Barton Springs to make this happen. We can do that. Um, it'll just cost you know like a hundred million dollars, and you know, they start saying things like that, and it's like uh, it's like okay, clearly this is not going to happen. So set those people up ahead of time." right? Start working them first so that they're coming into the situation saying, hey, this is something that has to be in the budget this year. So that they're working, they're working the process. You know, we don't have to, you know, it's not our place to say, but, you know, definitely we've gotten thousands of letters demanding this. Um, and it's something that if we don't do it, we're not going to meet our goals and we can do A, B, and C, and G, and like that sort of thing, right? So that's a process there too. Um, so that's how we did it. We set that policy context. We really, we got strategic about that budget process. We identified the right targets and we got creative about targeting them and making, the, and, and, and making that happen. And we went and found people where they were and activated them to make this happen. Um, and we won. Um, in the end, uh, they, uh, the, there was no real vote. It was in the budget. It was in the draft budget, so that makes your job a lot easier. You don't have to try and shoehorn it in. And then the only vote that they ever had on it was a motion by uh, Don Zimmerman, if people remember old Don, um, to strip it out of the budget. And it was an eight-to-one vote, and the other two that were gone, it w one would have been with us, one would have been against us. So, you know, a, a nine-two vote on that city council was not a bad thing to have. Um, and so that's, that's, that, that, that's it. We won. Um, so what's next on this? Um, it's going to be rolling out over the course of several years. This is something that we didn't win. We wanted to accelerate the rollout timeline. We may be advocating for an accelerated rollout timeline during this process, depending on how things go. Um, but we wanted to roll it out by 2020. By that point, it's going to be 210,000 households. Um, we're working right now on the processing contract. It's probably going to go to organics by gosh. And there's some questions about their facility and their operations. So we're watchdogging that process because if you screw that up, then the whole thing blows up in our face, right? And we can't sustain that. Um, the big gap, of course, is multifamily, right? 
because those 210,000 households are the ones served by ARR, Awesome Resource Recovery, um, and that's just single family households. What about the rest of us? Like I live in an apartment, I'm sure a lot of us, a lot of y'all do too. What about us? Um, we need to we need to find that solution. One possible and, and and partial solution is to really ramp up community composting, right? Like decentralized, not you know, like composting in community gardens, in uh, at far in collection points at like farmers markets, things like the compost peddlers, um, who are really good friends of ours, and I wanted to give them a special shout out because at that press conference at, that was on the first slide, um, they actually spoke in favor of this policy, even though it's going to take customers away from them. Right, they advocated for a policy that's going to cost them business because they knew it was the right thing for, for, for the environment, for our community. We need to develop, we're working with them to develop some new mechanisms for getting multifamily and that sort of thing. The good news is that uh, commercial businesses are covered under the Universal Recycling Ordinance and any business that has a food, a food permit is going to need to, to have a, a diversion plan for uh, organics by next, by next year. So that's a big deal. Um, and then education and outreach. How do we make sure that people know about this? How do we make sure that they know how to do it? That contract is up right now, um, and we're working to make sure that it's not just the same stuff that the city has always done. You know, ads on the sides of buses and, you know, and, you know a couple of things on KUT, but that it's actually getting in depth with that and, and actually talking to people where they're at. So that's what's next, um, and that's my contact information. Maybe anyone to talk to me. Uh, I think we have a little bit of time for Q&A, right? Um, so uh, I wanted to open it up for that. Uh, covered a lot of ground there. Um, who? Uh, what questions do people ask? Are we going to be coordinating with Dillo That's a great question. Um, the Dillo Dirt program is in some serious trouble, actually. Um, and let me step back and say, uh, not really, no. And it, the, the reason is, is be, it, the, for, there's a couple reasons why. For those who don't know, Dillo Dirt is the biosolids compost that's made from Austin sewage sludge. Um, when uh, our sewage goes to Hornsby Bend, which is the wastewater treatment plant, talk about not being allowed to think about where things end up. The the ideology of a way wastewater, like it's crazy. When you call, we we were doing research to find out about like about wastewater solutions around the state. You call like water departments and ask their staff where the sludge ends up, and nobody knows. There'll be like one or two people in the department that deal with that, and they're the ones that know. But even people who work. At, at the, the wastewater, wastewater treatment plant, plant won't know where the stuff ends up. It's, it's incredible. incredible. But, but our stuff, about two thirds of it is actually sent to East Texas, Texas and they land apply is just raw sludge, um, poisoning people's land and water and making people sick. Um, the other third of it is uh, turned into a compost product where we take our, our current organic, curbside organic, organic collection, which is yard waste, and grind that up and mix it with that um, and create a, 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 a biosolids compost that's known as dillo dirt. Uh, a lot of cities do that now. Austin is the pioneers on that. Um, we kind of created that, that process, which is really something to be proud of. Unfortunately, um, they have uh, mismanaged the project to a certain extent, and they're trying to find a new solution. You also, there's also two structural issues. One is you don't want to put your food waste in with your biosolids because you're going to have a much higher quality product with your food waste. And so you want to you want to have this high quality product over here and this lower quality product over here rather than just one low quality product, right? The, the other factor, factor is that we can't take this stuff to where we did, which would be awesome. I um, mean, if we just process it in-house, we could save a lot of money because it's right next to Austin Bergstrom International Airport, and you can't process food waste right next to the airport because it brings in birds. Um, birds and airplanes don't get along very well. Um, well, they do, but just not for the rest of us. Um, so, that, so, that's, so that's that. The builder program, it's, it's actually something that's consumed a lot of my time in the last few months because the city staff has has mismanaged the program to a certain center. They don't know how to manage it anymore. And they've been looking for a private partner. And the way that they went about that has been a subject of another hour-long talk. Um, so the answer is no, but we need to fix the too. I'm going to Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna see there is going to be an increase in fees. That's actually a great point that I should have talked about more than I did. Let me let me step into that in a, in a few different ways here. One is um, 
There is going to be a fee increase over time. It's going to phase in. It's going to be about five dollars and forty cents a month total for this service. That's the cheapest anywhere in the country. A lot of about two about three quarters of families will be able to uh, downsize their trash cart and actually offset that cost more or less entirely. And if we can get to, if we can change the way that we do pay as you throw um, to be a more granular and metered system. Um, then we could make it so that even the people already doing a lot could save money by, with this program. Um, it is important that people pay for their discards, okay? Because you remember, like the whole system that we were talking about at the beginning, you know, this concept of separating people from the responsibility for their discards, that's what creates the system. You need to price your discards because composting is great. It's better than landfilling, but it's not... It's not, not the ideal, ideal circumstance. The ideal circumstance is to reduce consumption overall, right? And, and so you want to have those economic signals that signal redu reduction of consumption. That's why recycling should never be free, right? Because you don't want people to recycle. You want people to not consume the stuff. If they're going to consume it, or then you want them to reuse it. And then, and then if they're not going to reuse it, you want them to put it in there. Same thing with this. You want them to you want to reduce that consumption. So I think that that's, that's another impact here. Um, the, we got it as low as we possibly could. We worked with a lot of different folks. That was the big question at the end is like this, this cost impact, the fee impact. Um, and we, we, we did everything we could to, to get it minimized for that and to, and to make sure that people had options to be able to, that we still have the pay you throw system. The cool point is that with that, you know, one of the things that we're able to do to, to, to make sure that we impact this is during that public input process, we really targeted that to really get our members and our supporters to weigh in as much as possible so that we could make sure that it wasn't just oftentimes, not your, your, not you, obviously, but oftentimes these programs will just be the people that want to show up and complain about something, right? That'll, that's often, if people watch Parks and Rec, I mean, I imagine that this crowd is a pretty big Parks and Rec fan base in there. The public meetings that they have is not really that exaggerated, right? And so we work to make sure that our voices were represented there too. And so that nobody could come back and say, well, all the people that were there just, just, just said bad things. So did that answer your question? Yeah. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, how much of the methane is diverted from the landfills here into, I don't know, I know in other counties they use the organics to like power their track, tractors and trucks and things. Yeah. Um, not a lot. I mean, we have, it's called uh, landfill gas energy or, or methane capture, recapture. We do some of that um, at, at various places. Uh, it's not a lot. We don't have, we haven't had very high quality stuff coming out, so it couldn't be used for fuel. It would often just be flared off or something. It wasn't, it wasn't being used for fuel. And frankly, those systems you got to be really careful about too. Because you've started to have a system, like this especially bad policy is when they start to give renewable energy credits for that. Because A, it, it, it plants the idea that trash is renewable, right, which is not. B, what they've done is they've created perverse incentives so that in some states that do that, they have they now what are known as bioreactor landfills, where they intentionally put organics in there, and then they hose it down with water before they do the entombment, like, the, the, like putting the clay down, to encourage the production of methane. Really dumb idea, because even when you do capture it like that, uh, I don't remember the percentage, but a significant amount of it still leaks, right? Just like with pipelines. So we're doing some, but you know, obviously the, the real solution is not, and I don't remember the exact numbers, um, but the real solution is just not to produce it at all. And then um, what is, is there a system for just like me with commercial composting, some more of like the, plus the cups and the, those things, like will this system be able to take Bigger. Yeah, I will, I will say that like the compostable plastics is a real issue of like controversy in the composting industry because a some of them are just lies, right? And there's no real standards for that stuff, right? Some of them are just not compostable at all. It's just plastic. They label it compostable, but it's not at all. Two, a lot of it is compostable, but not at a rate that is actually sustainable for the composters. So like they need to turn these things. They need to get rid of this stuff within three to six months. And some of that stuff will be like 18 months is how long it takes to break down. Now you've just got, you know, chunks of your flatware into the product, and they're going to screen it out and end up landfilling it anyways, right? And then they'll, or they might put it in the over, they'll be in the over, so they might get eventually broken down, but it creates problems for them. The, 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 the last piece of this is that a lot of those are, they'll break down fast enough, and they will break down, they'll break down fast enough, but it's not actually 
like good material for for soil, right? It's still it's still like a synthetic like like plastic or something that actually doesn't do have any benefit for the soils. So it really shouldn't be considered compost, right? It's a it's 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 an adulterant or a pollutant in the compost. So that said, if you're looking for solutions for composting in multifamily, the compost pilers is a great option. Um, and so definitely check them out first um, and see if they see if they serve your area and if you can and if you can afford that. The other option is to go to compostcoalition.com, which is a local not like a local grassroots nonprofit run by a friend of mine, Heather Nicole Hoffman. Um, uh, that uh, she's also on the Zero Waste Advisory Commission. Um, that that collects information about all the composting options in town and has a great map where you can go find drop offs or places or pick us. If you're composting on your own and you don't, let's say, say you don't have, let's say you have a small place and you don't have enough uh, greens or, uh, or uh, you don't have enough, uh, you don't have enough of the carbon material, you can go and find somebody who can give you carbon, right? Um, like, you know, plants and stuff like that, yard waste. So you, or, or vice versa, you, know, you can find other options. So compostcoalition.com is where I would check after you check the compost peddlers. Does that answer? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do I do compost peddlers, but I was wondering like I have a collection of those like commercial composting yeah. things sitting there. I'm like they don't want that, right? No, they don't. They yeah, because they don't take like meat or eggs, yeah. dairy. But it's like I have this pile sitting here of the commercial compost, and like I don't I'm not, I don't want to throw it away. Yeah, I mean I think that you know I, I wouldn't I would never tell you to throw it away necessarily, but um, in terms of that, I, I, there's not a lot of great solutions for it right now, to be honest. Huh? Get a pig, yeah. Feed your pig on 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 uh, on the the synthetic yeah the composting material. You kind of answered my question just a little bit last question okay. about life cycle changes and all this commercial composting and commercial yeah. recycling. Uh, re plastic that you can recycle, but it takes like uh, months yeah. to recycle. Yeah. No. So, and the other big problem is that, like, like there, there's a lot of folks because you know you, nobody can do that in a small scale system. You can't ever do that in your backyard. And what the compost peddlers do, um, for those who don't know, is they take the stuff from from people and they take it to local urban farms, community gardens, and even some people's backyards that have good backyard systems. So they're taking it to those small scale processors. That's why they can't do. That stuff, and then the, the the meat and dairy and that sort of thing requires special permits, um, and you know is is something that most backyard folks don't want to mess with. Go ahead. Just one more. Yeah. I've, I've always wondered um, cities have sort of gone through these cycles of using macerators and garbage disposal and things, and I know that that's not creating methane because we don't have organic waste going into the but it is increasing the sort of potential in the sewage systems. So. Yeah. Which one is like, what is yeah, uh, it's definitely a bad idea to put your food waste down the drain. Um, definitely a really bad idea. And in fact, what's really interesting is one of the first things I worked on when I got this job is fighting big garbage disposals. Um, you know, the big garbage disposal interests um, because they, the the main manufacturer, there's a near monopoly in the manufacturer of garbage disposals for a company called Insincorator. Go look at yours; you'll probably see Insincorator on it, right? Um, and Syncorator actually finds communities that are doing these zero waste programs and will go in and lobby them to try and get them to encourage people to put stuff down the drain. And it's really bad for a lot of different reasons. One is, as you noted, it puts a lot of pressure on the, on the sewage systems, right? All that stuff ends up kicking up in there, and now you've got a huge infrastructure problem, right? You know, as much as, you know, you know who has been talking about infrastructure, if you actually look at the infrastructure problem, if you actually look at what he's proposing, there's no actual, like, deep need infrastructure projects. There's boondoggles and, and gaudy crap, right? I know it's hard to believe. But the real need that we have right now, this is me speaking for myself now. Um, but the real need that we have are those, like, with those, like, kind of base level infrastructure projects, it's not happening. Like, Flint, Michigan's still bringing lead. Like, it's not happening. Um, and so we don't want to put any more pressure on those systems. The other thing is that even if it does make it all the way through, it ends up at that wastewater treatment plant, right? And for most places in Texas, that's not getting landfill anyways. So you're not actually diverting it. You're just sending it to the landfill via a huge energy suck. Of sending it down and water usage down uh, down the line, right? The, if they are, the, most of the places that aren't doing that are land applying it, so they're just dumping it on agricultural land. It's basically it's basically ending up as, as you know agricultural litter to a great extent. Um, the, the number of people that are doing something responsible with it, small. So uh, compost if you can. 
um, you know, landfill versus versus disposal. I would say it's probably. I, this is just my off. I don't. I, I, there may be people who dispute me on this, like are acting in good faith or calculating from good faith. But my just kind of immediate calculation is that landfill, like that landfilling, it immediately would be better because you don't have those impacts of that water consumption of sending it down the drain. Does that make sense? So one last question from Jake taking from the beginning. Um, I've talked about what you're doing kind of the zero waste side. In the beginning, you talked about production side solutions. I know in the EU, for example, there's directives that provide for corporations to figure out how to retrieve things at the end of the life cycle. Yeah. You know, that actually is incorporated into the product design. What extent are you guys working in terms of that? That has been a, a time and we're the ones, ones that are doing it. Doing it. Um, that's, that's something that's been our, our, our kind of bread and butter for years. years. Um, the, we got the TV and computer recycling laws passed in the state that are extended producer responsibility programs that require manufacturers of those products to have a stewardship program in place for the recovery of end of life uh, uh, products. This year, um, we are focused on household batteries at the Texas legislature. So this, uh, I'm, 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 City Hall has been like sneaking up and picking up my time for, for dumb reasons in the last couple of weeks. Um, but, but the but I'm focusing a lot. We're focused right now on, on the legislative session and getting this product stewardship program for uh, for some of these batteries. This is a mechanism for uh, for for reintroducing those in product for de-externalizing that, internalizing those costs back into the production system. Um, you know, it's been uh, anybody who tells you it's been an unadulterated success would be uh, would be selling you a bill of goods because it has been. Uh, challenging. There's been, you know, ups and downs and good sides and bad, and a lot of learned lessons at this point. Um, but that is it's absolutely crucial that we do that moving forward. Um, that, you know, that, like, frankly, the, the, real, the best solutions are not things that we're working on, because they're things that are politically untenable in this product, in this situation. The best thing to do would be to tax people for the discards, right? Um, and to make sure that, and to have landfill taxes and packaging taxes that uh, end up cascading back through the system and creating those incentives along the way. Even better would be to probably have a carbon tax that could not only capture all that, but would capture the larger impact on the climate and our thing. Don't think we're going to get a, climate tax, a, a carbon tax anytime soon in the United States. But that's not, like I said, what do we do until we can get there? We focus on the places, on those, on those places and points where we can intervene, and we organize and we activate and we build movements to do that, so that we can then change the context, and so that when we get there, we can solve those problems, and some of the problems that we would need to solve anyways will already be solved. That's how we do it. Um, you know, it's a tough time for everybody right now, but it's one day at a time. It's one foot in front of the other. It's finding the places where we can fight and win, and taking those battles to it. TC is going to keep doing that. I hope that everybody in here will keep doing it too. I know you will. So I'm excited. Thank you so much for having me. Well, you get, remember to take your pizza discards. And yeah. Not waste.